Equipping the saints, reaching the lost, WWMF, we invite you in. Oh, thank God for another week. And here we are together again. Look at the word of God. I'd like us to read together from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And our key text is verse 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concern the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. We read First John, and we have to say that it's probably the most intimate letter in the New Testament. And although John touched on many fundamental doctrines and truths within the Christian faith, it wasn't his purpose to write a treatise, as was very often the case with the Apostle Paul. First John deals with family matters. And we might compare it to a letter from a father to his small children who, who need to be encouraged, perhaps even reprimanded, and mostly to be reminded that God is love and that they are to manifest God's love constantly through their lives, to express God and God's love through their lives. And then there's a, an immediate reason why John wrote this letter when he did. You see, a group of so-called Christians known as Gnostics were perpetuating uh, a heresy within the church. They were teaching that all matter is inherently evil and God being good could have nothing to do with evil matter. That was their message. And therefore, they taught that God could not have been incarnate in the body of Christ. They said that Jesus only appeared to have lived in the flesh, that he was nothing more than a phantom. And to John, this false teaching was taking the heart out of the Christian faith. So his letter is like a, a manifesto. And by that I mean it proclaims what was shown and proved in the life of Jesus Christ. He was talking about, I wanted to make it very clear, of what he had seen, what he'd known, and what he'd proved of the life of Jesus. So in the prologue of this letter, which is the verses we've just read in chapter one, he told us three things about Jesus. And then he developed these truths in the remainder of the letter. So we're just looking at this, these, these four verses. First of all, in 1 John 1, 1 and 2, verses 1 to 2, John said that Jesus is the source of our life. John, he, he plunged into a, a series of truths or proofs that attest to the humanity of Jesus. First, he said that he and his fellow disciples heard Jesus speak. They physically heard him speak. And the verb heard is in the perfect tense which means that they heard Jesus not just one time, but repeatedly, and his words had been etched, engraved in their hearts. He was saying, I was there with Jesus. I heard him. And my fellow disciples, my brothers, as we follow Jesus, we heard him. Not just a one-off hearing him, we were with him 
day after day, week after week, month after week, after month. We heard him. We know what we heard. And now he's gone back to the Father. We can still hear his voice. And I have a, a, a slight understanding of that. My father passed away many years ago, but I, I love my dad, and my dad loved me. And it's quite amazing. Although he's been gone 20, 31 years, uh, soon 32 years, sometimes I hear my dad's voice, the memory of his voice, and the memory of the profound things that he said to me. No one can take that away from me. Although my father's been gone for all these years, I know he was my dad. I know I loved him. I know, I know he was real. He lived. He's gone through the Lord. But I can still remember what he says. And, and when John says, we have heard, I have an understanding of what he's talking about. He heard the words of Jesus. The disciples heard Jesus. Day after day. And what he said, it was etched and is etched on their memories. So no matter what other opinion people come with, they are producers of the truth that Jesus came in the flesh as the Son of God, made himself known. He is the incarnate one. And nothing could change that. And it, it, it made John want to speak out and, and set things right. Make it known that he had heard. Heard what Jesus said. Heard it not just once, but repeatedly. And no one could take away that from their hearts. Then John declared that he had seen Jesus. So he not just heard him, he had seen him. And the word John used for seen means more than having received a visual on, image on, on the retina of the eye. It means that he had understood, perceived, discerned. Then John said, which we have looked upon. We have looked upon. So th this is which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. Hallelujah. So he was filled with awe. Here, he used Another word that means to, to, to gaze at with wonder, awe, or reverence. And you have to understand, as they were with Jesus, there were things that caused them actually to gaze at Jesus and what he said and what he did with awe. John can remember the times he looked on in sheer wonder and the times when he re had to reverence what he'd seen, what he looked upon. There was, that, there was that awe, that reverence that caused him to wonder. You have to understand, he analysed. He had analysed things that, that had happened and had taken place. He saw them with his eyes. He'd wondered. He'd been caught up in awe and reverence. No one could take that from him. And he was making it known to the people, whatever false doctrine has been said, I want you to know I'm coming to you with the truth, that which I have experienced. In this time of lockdown, you've got to know Jesus for Christ for yourself. You've got to, to know him in that way, that when people come with their false ideas and their false doctrines and want to dissuade you or persuade you otherwise, you know that you know that you know that you know Jesus is your Lord and Saviour. Then finally, John said that he had handled Jesus with his hands. Jesus was no figment of imagination. He, he, he was no phantom. You can't handle a phantom. He was saying, listen to me, what I'm telling you is real. I touched him. 
I touched him. I handled him. He was flesh and blood, just like me. Hallelujah. Jesus was handled with his hands. This is the word, the same word that Jesus used after his resurrection to prove to his disciples that he was not a spirit, but that he had a body. Let's read Luke 24, 39. Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now you've got to understand, John was with Jesus before the resurrection. He knew that he was real. He handled him. He, he touched him. You know, he, he was there when, um, when, when Jesus said, somebody touched me. It was a different kind of touch he was talking about there, that woman with the issue of blood. You know, Jesus said, somebody touched me. And when, and when John thought about that touch, he said, oh, what are you talking about? Everybody's touching you. So Jesus was physical, that people could touch him. And, and, and when Jesus said, you know, somebody touched me, even then John looked at that kind of touch and thought, what kind of nonsense is this? Everybody's touching him. But Jesus said, no, this is a different kind of touch because I feel virtue come out of me. But what the, the touch that John's talking about here is that physical touch. Not the touch where virtue comes out, but the, the, the touch that you would touch your child, touch your, your loved one, your spouse, you know, touch their face and you know they're real and no one can tell you that they're a figment of your imagination. You know they're real. That's the kind of touch John's talking about. And so that was before the resurrection. Now, after the resurrection, they know that Jesus died. They, 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 they knew he was put in a tomb. They, saw, they knew the tomb was sealed. But he, he's, he's, come, he's risen from the dead, and now he's appearing to them. And, and in their mind, they were thinking, oh, yeah, he, he's some kind of spirit. This, this must be an illusion. We saw him die. We, we, we saw him being sealed in, 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 in the tomb. They had a, a watch, guards watching. We, we know he went in there. We know the physical body went in there. And yeah, yeah, he, he talked about rising again, but you know, that, that's outside of our, our understanding. That's, that's beyond our, 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 our concept of life. They didn't understand that. But here is Jesus, the resurrected Lord. He's, 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 he's risen from the dead and he's appeared before them. So we can understand them thinking, no, this can't be Jesus. But John says, we touched him. Because Jesus said, as we just read, behold my hands and my feet, this that it is I myself. And then he goes, handle me. It's the same kind of handling we're talking about. John saying that he handled Jesus with his hands and it's the same kind of handle Jesus saying, handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus said, I'm not a phantom. I'm not a figment of your imagination. It is me, I, myself. And that's what John is saying to these people here and saying to us today. It is Jesus himself and this doctrine of these people of total lies. Hallelujah. To, to know Jesus in that kind of way, to know him as a reality, hallelujah. That, and he's proven himself to you. So 1 John 1, 2 is an expansion of what John said in verse 1. Jesus, the source of our life, has been manifested and there is no way that his existence, his death or his resurrection can be denied. It's truth. It's reality. Hallelujah. And for those of us who have met with Jesus, we haven't physically physically touched him but we know that he we've met with him because he's so transformed our lives we're not the people we used to be we know his reality 
Hallelujah. We know he's real. No one can tell me that Jesus is not real. I know he's real. He's walked with me and he, he talks with me. I can, I can make references to experiences in my life from childhood. I gave my life to the Lord when I was a young girl at school. And, and he's made himself known to me. He, he's shown me that he's real, that no one can tell me that he's not real. I know he's real. I know that what John is saying is truth. Because Jesus Christ has revealed himself to me and made himself known to me. Even as a child, I can remember, and I'm, I'm now, I'm, now I'm really aging myself, dating myself, giving me a clue of how kind of old I am although I consider myself to be a perpetual youth. But I can remember I was coming home uh, in the early months of, of secondary school, just started secondary school. I don't know if those of you who are kind of my age group can remember when we had those constant um, strikes, when we had uh, uh, electricity outages, and, and for, for, it could go on for hours at a time. We had these continuous strikes and it affected the electricity and many people were without lights and heating. And it was, I can remember, it was quite clear it was winter and as we were, I was walking home, it was, it was dark and all of a sudden there was outage of the electricity. All the street lights went out. There was no moon, no stars. It was a, a, a very uh, dark night, clouded. Uh, it had rained. And I was coming home from school and the road was absolutely pitch black and I can remember standing in the road and felt this overwhelming fear because I couldn't see anybody else on the road it was a side road coming towards my house nobody else was on the road it was pitch black I had to stand for my eyes to get accommodated to the darkness to see where I was going and I was overcome by fear. As a matter of fact, I have to use the word petrified. Normally I would walk home on my, with a friend, not on my own, but this particular evening I was on my own and I was petrified. I stood in the road petrified. And all I could do is call out in Jesus, say, Jesus, I'm so frightened, I'm so frightened. I can't move from this spot. And I heard a voice say, do not be afraid. I am with you. And I had this sense of presence, this overwhelming sense of presence. I felt the presence of the Lord. I felt, I knew he was there. It was, I felt safe. I felt secure, but it was such a strong sense of presence that I felt as if I, if I reached out, I could physically touch him. And do you know, the fear dissipated, it went, and I walked all the way home, and when I got to my door, that overwhelming sense of presence, of, of someone walking with me, someone standing with me, disappeared because I was saved. And I've, got, I've had many, 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 many different experiences in my life where the Lord has sent his Holy Spirit and made himself known with his presence. But I can tell you, no one can tell me that Jesus isn't real. He's real. He's God incarnate. We know he's, he's not in his flesh right now on earth. We know it's his spirit that's here. But I know that Jesus came as a babe in Bethlehem, grew up to be a man, went to that cross, died upon that cross for our sins and rose again and is alive forevermore, now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. He's real and his Holy Spirit is here. That's what John was saying. That's what John was saying. I know I know he's real and his existence, his death, his resurrection cannot be denied. Secondly, John said that Jesus is the subject of our preaching. In verse 3, our text, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. 
that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. In verse 1, John spoke of the word of life. These words were drawn, were, were, were the dawn, actually, the dawn that broke through, through the darkness of sin. Jesus, the word of life. It was the dawn that broke, that broke the darkness. When you see a, a dark night, we know that, that, that morning's coming because the dawn breaks the darkness. And, and, you, and you, you, I'm sure you're experiencing it now as we're going into the winter, winter time and the clocks have, have gone back and you, and you see in the morning, you can, you can see the, 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 the light coming and, and, and the, the night withdrawing. As the dawn comes, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. But you see, with Jesus... As the dawn broke the darkness of sin, that dawn became noonday. The splendor, as John identified the word of life as Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that's brought us the light. The noonday, the word, the word of life is Jesus Christ, God's son. And this Christ is the one whom we have seen with the eye of our souls and heard through the living words of Scripture. We've, we see him through the eyes of the soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And we, we hear him through the living words of Scripture. Read the Word of God and you will hear the voice of God. You will know his voice. Living words. Words that will nourish your soul. Words that give you hope and purpose. You know, John said something that shocked every God-fearing Jew who would not so much as pronounce the name of God. You know, a really, really devout Jews would not, never, ever call the name of God. They felt unworthy even to, to sound, to sound, to speak his name. And, and, and he said, John says, our fellowship is with the Father. How dare a sinful creature presume that he can fellowship with the almighty God of creation? When John said that, they must have been horrified. But because of Jesus, we have come into that relationship of sonship. That we can call God our father and we can have fellowship with the father. The secret lay in the blessed intercessor, Jesus Christ. He introduced people to God as the Father. Our fellowship with God as Heavenly Father comes through our relationship with his Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus and Jesus alone is the subject of our preaching. We preach Christ and him crucified. Christ risen from the dead. That's what we preach. And if anyone comes with any other gospel, then he's a curse. But our message, what we preach to you, what we bring to you is Jesus Christ and him alone. And then thirdly, John wrote about sharing our faith in verse 4. Let's look at the order here. He says, and these things we write to you that your joy may 
be full. Real joy comes after fellowship with God, his son and his children. After that has been established, then real joy comes. So we have to have fellowship with God. We have to have fellowship with the son and we have to have fellowship with his children. And when, when that, those relationships are established, then we know what real joy is. Then real joy comes. This unique fellowship enables us to experience true joy. If you want to know what true joy is, you need to know and have fellowship with the Father. You need to have fellowship with Jesus Christ the Son. You need to have fellowship with God's children. For we are his children. And as we have fellowship with him, as we are, are, are together in him, then we get true joy. You know, it's quite amazing. I was, I was talking to someone and, and, and they were saying to me, you know, I'm having more fellowship now with uh, my brothers and sisters in the Lord in this lockdown than I did when we were in church. Though we can't physically be with everybody, but she was saying that, you know, being able to, to, to see people on Zoom and, and to talk and to, to talk to people on the phone, and it, it, she said the fellowship is so sweet. So I, I feel closer to my brothers and sisters in this period of separation, although we're not in church together, worshiping together. She said this fellowship is so sweet. Oh, it's so wonderful. She, and, and we were talking about having the fellowship with the Father and fellowship with the Son, taking time to get to know Jesus and, and to know the Father in a way we never had time to do before. We've got more time on our hands. We can organize our life better, that we can have fellowship. And it's not just ordinary fellowship. We're now having ex extraordinary fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And because we're having extraordinary fellowship with the Father and with the Son, we're thinking about our brothers and sisters, people we wouldn't normally think about. God's put them on our heart and we're ringing them and we're connecting and, and, and praying together. Oh, it's awesome. It is awesome what God is doing through our lives. Jesus desired that his followers have joyful hearts. Never in the Bible are, are, are Christians instructed to be depressed or pessimistic. One of the goals of Jesus that Jesus had in mind as, as he taught his disciples was for them to experience joy. In John 15, 11, we read, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. That is what the Lord wants every one of us to experience. That fullness of joy. What was the joy that filled Jesus' soul? And as I close, it was the completion of our salvation. Let's read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Likewise, our joy is based on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Salvation and joy are inseparable. Because we have salvation, we have the joy of the Lord. And this contagious joy adds an effective note to the sharing of our faith. Oh, hallelujah. We want to share Jesus. The Christ that we preach, we preach 
because of the joy we have in knowing him, in having fellowship with him and him having fellowship with us. This is the Christ whom we preach. He is the source of our life. He's the subject of our preaching. Because of who he is, we share our faith so that others may know this joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And we have to say at the, the songwriter, the half has never yet been told. Oh, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. The half has never yet been told. Be encouraged. The Christ that we preach is our hope. And we are looking for him any minute now to come and we're going to be caught away to meet him. Detach yourself from everything else. Just run with this gospel message and look for our Christ who's going to return. This same Jesus that you seem taken up into heaven shall return in like manner. I'm looking for him. I'm expecting him. Nothing the devil or man does is going to dampen my excitement, my expectations and my anticipation. My joy is full in Christ. He's coming back for me and he's coming back for you. Are you ready? That's the Christ we preach. God bless you. Equipping the saints, reaching the lost, WWMF. We invite you in, we welcome you in, WWMF. Equipping the saints, reaching the Lord.